All right, Biochem, here we go. This is our lipids video, our first lipids video. I have broken this into four different parts. Instead of making four different videos, I just did one video with four parts. So there's gonna be some breaks throughout this. And in each part, I'll tell you what the learning objectives are. So we're gonna start with part one. And these are the learning objectives for part one. We're gonna meet quite a few vocab words. So it's a good opportunity for flashcards, but you're gonna need to be able to divine, define the vocab words. You're also gonna to need to be able to draw fatty acid from symbolic notation and vice versa. You should be able to predict melting temperature and properties based on fatty acid structure and compare and contrast and explain the properties of various dietary fats. So what are the structural requirements of most lipids? Not all lipids, but most lipids. A lot of times in biology, what you'll see is the lipids are represented in this cartoon form where there's a circle on the top. Sometimes it has a color to it. Sometimes it doesn't. And then there's this tail on the bottom. A lot of times there are actually two tails on the bottom. And this is meant to represent a generic lipid with what's called a polar head group on the top and then the nonpolar tails on the bottom. And this is just the easy peasy way of cartoon representing a lipid. But in biochem, we can do a little bit better than that. We want to be able to describe what does this actually mean? So for the lipids that we're gonna talk about today, they ha all have polar head groups and they have hydrophobic tail groups. And what that means is that structurally, what's sort of drawn, I guess like what I would say on the top of this di skeletal diagram, are all of the functional groups that make favorable non-covalent interactions with water. So for example, if I zoom in on this fatty acid here, I could draw a very favorable ion dipole with water. And that makes this functional group at the top or the head group at the top, that makes it polar. It's polar and it has a favorable non-covalent interaction with water. This one also has several non-covalent, favorable non-covalent interactions with water, as does this one that's all the way over here on the right that's quite large. Again, you've got ion dipole interactions. You've got hydrogen bond interactions. So that's what makes these lipids well, lipids, is that they have these polar head groups that have favorable interactions with water. And then on the bottom, they have what's just all nonpolar. So it's everything that is CH bonds or CC bonds. And we know from electronegativity that that makes them all nonpolar. And so the quick and easy dirty way of drawing a lipid is to put a circle on the top, say that's the polar head group, and put some tails on the bottom and call them the nonpolar tails. And we'll see this kind of play out in several different kinds of lipid structures because there's quite a few different kinds of lipid structures. So for example, this one has just a teeny tiny polar head group and a pretty significant nonpolar tail. Um, this one's a nonpolar head group sort of spans across the whole top. And this one has three tails. And again, this is the nonpolar head group here, tail here. Um, this representation right here is not skeletal. This is called spheres, where every atom is represented in its actual size, like its atomic size, how much space it would take up. And every single, literally every single atom is represented um, in this, and it's sort of relative 3D shape. So you can kind of see how bulky this tail is and how tiny um, the polar head group is. But what this means for all of these that are drawn here that have these polar head groups and nonpolar tails means that they're amphipathic, or you may have also heard the term amphoteric. And this means that they have both a nonpolar and polar uh, parts of the molecule, sections of the molecule. Sometimes I like to say this as like they bat <laughs> both left and right-handed. They're ambidextrous. They have both parts. They're polar and they're nonpolar. 
So we're going to start with the simplest of the lipids, which is the fatty acid. It's the simplest, it's the smallest, um, and we're going to introduce a bit of vocab here before we get started with some drawing. So the fatty acids are named, well, for exactly what they look like. They have a carboxylic acid functional group on here. This is the acid part. And then they have the fat part. So that's why they're called fatty acids is because they have this greasy nonpolar tail and a carboxylic acid. And again, these are just three different kinds of representations of the exact same thing. The pKa of that carboxylic acid is about four. So at pH seven, the carboxylic acid should be overall negative charge. And that's what you would see um, in the aqueous pH seven uh, areas of the cell is the fatty acid will have that charge on the tail. The fatty acid tail is usually about 12 to 24 carbons long. Sometimes we get odd numbers, um, but they're just a little bit more rare. Okay, more vocab. Some more vocab. So we have some different kinds of nomenclature depending on whether there are double bonds in the fatty acid tail or not double bonds in the fatty acid tail. So the top uh, fatty acid here, the stearate, is considered a saturated fatty acid because it has no double bonds. Oleate or oleic acid is unsaturated. It has lost two hydrogens to create that double bond. And so it has unsaturated just means at least one double bond. A lot of times we would just call this mono unsaturated to indicate that there's only one double bond in the tail. And then uh, linoleic acid, it has multiple double bonds. So we'll call this poly unsaturated fatty acid. I'm just gonna do FA for fatty acid. All right, so then there are from this two different kinds of double bonds. This is probably a little bit of review. But on the unsaturated fatty acids, they can either be cis or trans isomer around that double bond. In nature and in your cells, most naturally occurring fatty acids are cis. And this is going to become important um, a little bit late, later. But if you'll remember, the trans fatty acids have this double bond that sort of continues with the zigzag formation where the R groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. So for example, uh, this is one R group, and this is the other R group, and they're coming off of opposite sides of that double bond. And in the cis, the R groups are like sisters on the same side. And again, just what's on the other side of those double bonds are just hydrogens. Okay, so now time to draw. Um, there is a unique way of nomenclature for fatty acids that's really straightforward and kind of satisfying to draw. So we're gonna start with, uh, I'm just gonna start giving you examples and I'm gonna draw, I think I'm gonna do two examples. So this is called symbolic notation for fatty acids. So the first one that I'm gonna draw, this is a symbolic notation. I'm just gonna pick one, 20 colon two trans, delta 8 comma 12. All right, what does this mean? So the first number here is just the number of carbons in the chain, or the total number of carbons long. The number that comes after the colon is the number of double bonds. This first bit in the parentheses tells you the shape of the double bonds. 
And then these two numbers that come um, up on top of that delta are the location of the double bonds. All right, so let's draw this out. I like to start with my fatty acid on the left, just so I don't have to worry about it. And I'm just gonna assume pH seven, so I put my negative charge there. And if you remember from organic chemistry, the carbon that is the most electronegative is carbon number one. And for fatty acids, that's always the carboxylic acid carbon. So here we go. I'm gonna count out till I get to the first double bond, which is at carbon number eight. So that's number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Carbon number eight should have a trans double bond. And that makes this carbon number nine. And then I go 10, 11, 12, which is my next double bond. That makes this carbon 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, so I'm just gonna number all my carbons now just to make sure that I didn't goof any of them. So I have carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, I did it, looks great. I'm gonna do one more example um, just for good measure and then we'll move on. Let's see, I'm gonna do a different color, do black. Um, let's, I'm gonna do a little bit shorter. Okay, so let's do a 16 colon three cis delta, Seven, nine, twelve. All right, carboxylic acid goes down first, and then I'm gonna go out to carbon number seven. Remember this, carboxylic acid carbon is number one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, to eight, cis double bonds, because it says cis right here. To nine, another double bond, cis, to 10. 11, 12, that makes this 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, I'm gonna count just to make sure. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Awesome. So that's our first part of symbolic notation for fatty acids. So you should be able to draw fatty acid from symbolic, from given symbolic notation and also be able to give the symbolic notation if you were given a structure. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about what happens when you have mixtures of fatty acids. Like what is the implication of this? Because fatty, you don't just get one fatty acid molecule at a time. You get you know, a population of fatty acid molecules. So I'm just gonna draw, um, I'm gonna draw three populations here uh, going left to right. So bear with me for just a second. Okay, so first in green, I have my saturated fatty acids. I'm actually gonna talk through some of this. So I have a mixture of all saturated fatty acids. And then the middle one, I have a mixture of trans fats. And then this third group I'm gonna make are the cis fats. So one thing that is 
you may not know about cis fats is that they actually form kinks. They don't lay or they don't stack perfectly flat. And so I'm only going to draw two of these just for the sake of. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. I think you get, I think you get the idea. So these ones are the cis fats. Okay, so based on shape and based on interaction, if we go left to right here, the saturated fats fit the best. They have like the best shape complementary that makes them, them sort of like these puzzle pieces where their shape is um, a perfect fit. And between them, there's a ton of Van der Waals interactions. And that makes them, there's just so many Van der Waals, that makes them very, very stable. And in real life, what this translates to is this is essentially would make butter, something that is a solid. It's so, so stable because the shape fits like puzzle pieces and the non-covalent interactions, there's so many of them that it solidifies and turns into butter, some kind of solid. The trans fats have also um, this wonderful shape puzzle piece. I'll just put shape check mark. Um, they also fit together like puzzle pieces, but because we're missing some of those hydrogen bonds, we have less van der Waals. So I'll just draw just to make a point. Less interactions between the pieces, which makes these a little bit less stable. Um, and instead, a mixture of trans fats sort of has the, the texture of spreadable butter. still have good shape interactions, we still have non-covalent in, um, shape interactions and non-covalent interactions, but just less of it. And so it's a little bit less stable than butter and so more like fluidy. And so you get that creamier, uh, spreadable butter texture. And then finally, the, the, the cis fats do not have good shape, uh, good shape puzzle piece interaction. Um, I'll put a sad face for that. And what that means is that they don't stack perfectly. They, they make even fewer non-covalent interactions because they just can't get close enough to one another. And so what these end up coming out to be are more like your olive oils. So olive oils are really high in the cis fats, and that's what makes them so liquidy is because the cis conformation means that they just can't, they can't get close enough to one another. And ultimately, this impacts what, we, um, what we're able to sort of predict with melting temperatures and melting points. So because butter is the most stable, it has the highest um, melting point. And the olive oil is the least stable, so it has the lowest melting point. So if you were looking at, you know, some pictures of things or you were going through your pantry um, you might be able to see, okay, that sesame seed oil is a liquid, probably has mostly cis fatty acids in it, um, that uh, gooey, creamy, buttery looking thing is not quite solid, not quite liquid, probably mostly trans fats. And then if you were to open your fridge and you saw, you know, a hunk of, uh, or even, you know, just a hunk of Crisco or something that was solid and made of fats, um, that's mostly saturated fats. And so we can take this a little bit further and basically do predictions based on what we know, um, what we know about the composition of the fatty acids. So when we look at, um, a mixture that is saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids, the saturated fatty acids are going to have the higher, melting point or melting temperature than the unsaturated because these just simply stick together much much better so that would be the difference between this saturated versus this is a mixture of saturated and unsaturated you just see how they just don't stick 
closely together so they can't, the unsaturated just can't form a solid. Um, trans fats, a mixture of trans fats versus cis fats, trans fats will also have the higher melting temperature. And then if you had a mixture of, this would be considered um, pure fatty acids because they're all the same versus a mixture of fatty acids, the pure fatty acids would also have a higher melting temperature. And these first three all have an assumption, and that is they assume that the tail, the chain length, is the same length. So but I would sort of mean that um, in this first one, these would all have to be 18 colon zero, and these would all have to be like 18 colon one. They have to have uh, sort of an apples to apples chain length on them. Whereas this bottom one assumes differences in chain lengths. And so a longer chain length will have a higher melting temperature than a shorter one. Um, and that's just because you get even more Van der Waals interactions with longer chains than you do shorter chains. And if you remember, the more non-covalence formed, um, that will increase the stability. And if you're thinking in terms of uh, thermodynamics, this is a negative delta H, which then contributes to a more negative delta G. So the more non-covalence that you form, the higher the stability, um, and that contributes to a negative delta H, which helps uh, get you to a more negative delta G. So those are sort of the basics of fatty acids, their structures, their symbolic notations. I just wanted to just Da, 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 dive into just a couple um, examples of dietary fats. So fats that you find in a typical human diet. So a common fat is lard or pig fat. And you, this isn't a picture of it. And this type of fat is pretty abundant in two types of fatty acids, this palmitic and stearic acid, which the structures are down here. And you'll notice that both of these are completely saturated uh, fatty acids, and that means that when they stack together, they have great puzzle pieces, or they have great shape connections, and they make lots of van der Waals, and so that is why pig fat, or lard, is a solid. Other kinds of fat that you get in your diet are a lot of times from oils, so the oil is typically named for where it comes from, from the seed that it comes from. Seeds are very rich um, in fatty acids. So and other lipids. So like olive oil comes from olives. Sesame seed oil comes from sesame. Peanut oil comes from peanuts. But there's this whole class that's just simply called vegetable oil, which seems a bit broad. And even, even more so, there's this brand that's canola oil. It's a very popular type of vegetable oil. And that oil actually comes from a plant, the seed um, is called Brassica rapum, and the source of it is called rapeseed oil. And traditional plant breeding was used to create the seed that is very, very rich in this rapeseed oil. But when Canada went to go market this, they weren't going to call it rapeseed oil. I mean, obviously, you can probably figure out why, but instead they call they marketed it as canola oil um, or vegetable oil, and it has a particular taste. Um, and you use it for particular things. But because it's a liquid, um, these fatty acids and canola oil are mostly all unsaturated. Less van der Waals, less shape-shape uh, interactions. So that makes these fats more unstable, a less negative delta G, a less negative delta H. And the oil, the packing together of these um, lipids is more liquidy. All right, so a lot of the oils, these sort of like healthy um, fats are what are called omega fats or omega-3 fats. There's also omega-6 and omega-9s and the omega-3s and the omega-6-9s, they have a specific kind of notation with them. The omega, I'll just read this and then I'll just show you how to draw it, means that the first double bond on the third, that there's a double bond on the third carbon from the end. All right, let's just draw it. All right, so again, I'm going to just put my fatty acid here. 
and or my acid group and then I'm just going to all right so if you remember your Greek alphabet the beginning is the alpha and the end is the omega so in this notation this carbon right here is considered alpha and the carbon at the end is the omega carbon remember the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end if you go backwards if you count backwards until you get to the first double bond that gives you the number of the omega so this is an omega 3 fatty acid and omega-3 fatty acids are almost always cis, um, and that's because those are the healthy fats, and we are going to talk about that very, 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 very soon. So that's how you do omega notation. You go to the end, count backwards, um, and that gives you your omega-3, 6, 9. You can also have omega-3, 6, and 9 all together. Okay, there are lots of food applications where it's desirable to have the texture of solid fat with the inexpensiveness of vegetable oil. For example, think of the white stuff in the middle of Oreo cookies. Vegetable oils can be made solid by chemically hydrogenating some or all of their double bonds. The hydrogenated vegetable oil has a perfect texture for Oreo cookie filling. Okay, so again, this is the reason... One of the reasons that we have all these interesting, <laughs> weird foods like Oreo cookies is because of the inexpensiveness of vegetable oil. It's really, really cheap to make uh, vegetable oil. It's not as cheap to uh, get to solid fats or to get solid fats from animals. It's a lot cheaper, faster to grow the plants instead of harvest them from the animals. Okay, so if you think about what the heck does partial hydrogenation mean? So if you take the vegetable oil, which has mostly, um, right, cis double bonds, because it's a liquid, and you hydrogenate it, which means you add hydrogen um, with palladium as the catalyst, what you'll get is the hydrogen adding itself across some of these double bonds. Oops, why did I pick the highlighter? Well, I don't know. We're going to roll with it. I'm not going to do it across that one for a good reason. So you'll get partial hydrogenation, which just means that some but not all of the double bonds um, have become saturated, have become single bonds. And the more saturation that you get, the more solid-ish that you get. You don't want full hydrogenation because you don't want your Oreo cookie to be like completely solid in the middle. You want that creamier, fluffier, uh, gooier um, stickiness. And so that's what partial hydrogenation will do. Now, the tricky part is what happens when you eat these. So the cis, these, these fatty acids are really important when you eat them from just regular vegetable oil or olive oil, not from the Oreo cookie, are important because they often get incorporated into your membranes. I'll just kind of draw this as like a membrane structure. And they're important for membrane fluidity. So the more um, cis fatty acids, omega fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, the more fluid your lipid bilayers are. And the more fluid your lipid bilayers are, the easier it is for things like CO2 to come out and oxygen to come through and the lipid bilayer itself, like things move through it. Whereas if you eat these saturated um, trans fats, partially hydrogenated fats, those will also get incorporated into your membranes. And the more that you have these incorporated, the less fluid your cell membranes become. So I like to think of this as like the butter cell, butter cell membrane. Uh, and that's bad. So in general, chunks in your body are bad, but if you can imagine that your 
um, cell wall or your cell membranes are hardening or getting more solid, then things like oxygen can't get in and things like CO2 can't get out. So there's things that get trapped inside the cell and then there's essential components and nutrients that can't get in. So in general, um, these hydrogenated um, oils, saturated fats, and trans fats tend to be um, very unhealthy. Okay, we are done with part one. This is a great place to pause, stand up, take a breath, get some coffee, go do something else for a little bit, um, and come back for part two. Okay, welcome back. Or if you're still here, hi. This is um, part two. So the learning objectives for part two for our lipids here are compare or rank the polarities of the lipid categories, recognize and draw the four phospholipids that will be mentioned, and recognize the structural differences between phospholipids and glycolipids. Okay, so let's imagine that you have eaten some Oreo cookies um, and the fatty acids have been released from the creamy part in the middle those fatty acids don't stay as like what I call free fatty acids for very long. They don't float around in your body as free fatty acids. They don't get, they don't float around in the cells as free fatty acids. They have to be incorporated um, fairly readily. And fatty acids are the starting materials for all the other types of lipids. So I'm just going to make you a diagram. Um, we're not going to talk about all of these lipids today, uh, but we will talk about them in the next video. Okay, so if I start with my fatty acid, up at the top here, this is what I would call a free fatty acid. It's not bound into anything. Okay, if we take this free fatty acid, and we actually we take three of them, um, and an enzyme, so if we take three fatty acids and what's called a glycerol molecule. So glycerol is an important molecule to remember. It has three carbons, one, two, three, and off of each carbon is an, is an alcohol group. So if we take three fatty acids plus one glycerol, we get the structure that looks like this. So there's that glycerol. And then we're going to add a carbon tail to each one of these. So there's one fatty acid, two fatty acid, three fatty acid. These are called, I'm going to have to make this just a little bit up here like this. <clears throat> these are called tri- acyl glycerols or tags and their main function is energy storage okay so this is one uh, class or category of of lipids or tags okay then the next one is if you take the free fatty acid and you sort of break it down, and then you build it back up again, you get a lipid molecule that's called a sterol. And sterols are membrane support lipids. So this is another category of lipid. So we've got tags, sterols, another set of membrane lipids, are um, what's called phospholipids. So again, we're gonna take, for this one, we're gonna take two fatty acids and we're gonna take one phosphate group. Oh, oh, oh. And we're gonna take uh, just one other functional group. I'll just put FG for functional group. And we also need a glycerol. And so we build the the phospholipid, there's that glycerol backbone, O, 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 carbon, 
carbon. There's, here's one fatty acid, two fatty acids, and then I'm gonna put my phosphate on this other one. I'm just gonna move this way because I've got a little bit of crunch for space. Um, there's my phosphate, my glycerol, and then, oops, that's up there. And then what's coming off of this is that other functional group, and these are called phospholipids. Okay, third type of lipid. And their function is membrane structure. Okay. And then there's two other kinds of lipids. Um, again, starting with that free fatty acid as a starting material, we can get to this type of lipid that's called an icosanoid. And then we can also, uh, and their, their function is signaling. So that is type number four. And then finally, the last type is we take the free fatty acid, we go to a sterol, specifically cholesterol. And then from there, we make the steroids. And that is type number five, and their function is also signaling. Okay, so today we are going to look at the membrane lipids. So we're gonna look at sterols, um, and the phospholipids, starting with the phospholipids, making the membranes, and then we're going to add the sterols in to the membranes. And the reason that I have drawn this diagram in this particular way is because if we go left to right, we have the lipid categories that are the most nonpolar to the least nonpolar or you could also think of this as least water soluble to most water soluble okay there it is okay so we're going to start with the four phospholipids that you're gonna need to be able to draw uh, from memory and I'm going to help you figure out how to do this in a way I don't know that I think makes a little bit of sense okay so again like I said the basic structure of every phospholipid is that they have the glycerol backbone that's this part right here the three carbons each one has an oxygen coming off of it so we call this glycerol backbone I'll highlight it in each of these. Three carbons, each one has an oxygen coming off of it. Looks like that. They also each have two acyl tails. When the fatty acid gets added on to the glycerol backbone, it's not an acid anymore because there's no COO minus. It's an ester bond instead. And so they're called acyls. So each one of these has two acyl tails that were once fatty acids, free fatty acids, but they're no longer free. Um, and then coming off of the third carbon, each of these has one phosphate. And then the last piece is this R group. This is what makes each of the phospholipids unique. This is that sort of other functional group that we talk about. So I'm gonna go through and show you how to recognize them. And then by practicing, you will learn how to draw them. So the first one is this phosphatidyl, just means that there must be a phosphate. Um, it's a phospholipid. And then choline is the nitrogen with three methyl groups coming off of it. That's a choline. And that nitrogen has a positive charge because it has four bonds coming off of it. Um, and in between the nitrogen and the phosphate, there are 
two CH2 groups. So that's phosphatidylcholine. But that functional group with the nitrogen with the three methyl groups um, is called a choline. Phosphatidylethanolamine means coming right off of the phosphate is an ethanol. And if you remember methyl ethyl, ethanol has two carbons and there you could use that O for the alcohol. And amine is an NH3. And that NH3 would have a relatively high pKa, say somewhere around 10. So at pH 7, it would have a positive charge. So ethanolamine has an amine group and an ethanol chunk to it. Phosphatidylglycerol has a glycerol coming off of the phosphate. So again, you're looking for three carbons in a row, and each carbon has an OH group. Okay, phosphatidylglycerol. And the last one is phosphatidylserine. So from your amino acids, this is how it goes. Here's the backbone the NCC backbone, so amino, amine, O acid, has the amine attached to a carbon, attached to a carboxylic acid. And then this is the side chain is going towards the phosphate. So CH2 and then to the O. I'm just going to draw serine on the side here. So NCC, there's that amino acid, and then coming off is a CH2OH. So this, this OH is what's connected to um, the phosphate. So that's phosphatidylserine. The way that these are represented cartoon-wise uh, is that the phos phosphatidyl plus it's whatever it's called, the part here up on top, let me highlight it. The part that's here up on top is the polar head group. I guess we could also include glycerol, part of glycerol. Polar head group, polar head group, polar head group. And so this, we'll all have this big polar head group up top. And because there are two acyl tails, it's usually represented looking like this. That's what the phospholipids look like. The other type of membrane lipid are called sphingolipids. These are also represented uh, with this um, two squiggly tail uh, attached to a polar head group. There's just some unique connectivities here. You don't need to um, learn how to draw these, but you do need to learn how to recognize them. So the unique features here are instead of the glycerol backbone, this whole pink thing is called a sphingosine backbone. Another unique connection is this amid bond to the first tail. Um, this is considered the second tail. So this is, whoops, what am I doing? This is one tail, this is two tails. That's how you get the two tails. And then it's this X group down here that changes. And in this particular case, there's no phospho anything on it. In this one, it has um, three sugars attached to it or three monosaccharides, which makes this an oligosaccharide, a trisaccharide. And the way that I know, how do I know that each of these um, are, are saccharides or sugars or carbohydrates? is because there's a ring structure and coming off of every single carbon, uh, what am I doing? Down, 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 up, down, doesn't matter, is an oxygen. So there's a ring and every carbon has an oxygen. Uh, it might be attached to something else, but there's three of them. And the way that we call this type of lipid because it has this sugar structure, these are called glyco lipids because this is the glyc part. Glyc, glac, gluc, glyc always equals sugar. Okay. 
So this is just a, a recap of the phospholipids and the glycolipids. So phospholipids here, glycolipids here, and just the main components of their structure. So the phospholipids have to have that phosphate on them. And then the uh, glycolipids have to have the saccharide on them or that sugar group on them. But you'll notice that all of these have two tails. They all have two tails and they all of them have polar head groups. I'll just circle the polar head groups down here. So these are all membrane lipids. They have to be amphipar am sorry, amphoteric, amphipathic. They have to have a polar head group and two tails um, to be considered um, these kinds of phospholipids and glycolipids, uh, which are part of the membrane lipids category. Okay, that brings us to part three. Again, another great place to take a breath, stand up, get some coffee, drink some water, and then come back when you're ready. So this part three might be the one of the most important chunks of a video that you will ever watch in biochem because it contains all the things you need to know about this concept called the hydrophobic effect. So make sure that your brain is in the right spot. You're ready to take notes. Um, this is just crucial to understanding, uh, I don't know, pretty much all of biochem. So the learning objective for this part is to use thermodynamics to describe the formation of membranes lipid bilayers, vesicles, and micelles. Eventually, we're going to extend this on to use thermodynamics to explain how proteins fold, how DNA forms, how polysaccharides um, curl up on one another. But today, we're going to focus it on lipids. So just so you know, this isn't specific to lipids. This is a concept that applies across biochemistry. The reason it applies across biochemistry is because all of biochemistry happens in water. And the hydrophobic effect essentially describes how molecules associate or interact when they're placed in water. And your whole body is water. I mean, everybody at one point in time, we were all in the ocean, swimming around, swimming around, and then... Somebody's just packaged up the water in skin or some way of en encapsulating it, encompassing it, and just walked out of the water. And so you carry the ocean with you um, inside of you and in every single cell. And so describing, so the interaction of molecules in water pretty much describes how your cells form, how your proteins fold, how drugs interact in your body. And it's, it's just crucial. And in general, we call this concept um, hydrophobicity. And for example, glucose is very soluble in water. This is glucose. And hexane, that's hexane, is not. And we would say glucose is hydrophilic. It's a vocab word. And hexane is hydrophobic. And the reason that glucose is hydrophilic is because it forms... favorable non-covalent interactions with water. So anything that's hydrophilic forms favorable non-covalent interactions. Doesn't have to be hydrogen bond. It could be ion dipole. It could be dipole dipole. It could be um, salt bridging. Um, but it has to form a favorable interaction with water because hydro means water and philic means loving. So glucose loves water because it can form favorable non-covalent interactions with water. Whereas hexane, hexane, hexane does not. There are no favorable interactions with water. And so this molecule is described as hydro, water, phobic, or hating. Hates water. It, doesn't inter it does, prefers not to interact with water because it does not form favorable non-covalent interactions with water. 
And so the aggregation of molecules in water or how molecules come together in your cells, in your body, is called the hydrophobic effect. I'm going to talk about this a lot, a lot, a lot throughout this class. Okay, this is the best way that I have of describing this concept, which um, is kind of a tough one. Yep, because we're going to add thermodynamics onto it. But first, let's just conceptually try to understand what the hydrophobic effect means. So when you put a nonpolar molecule in water, and this is just our, our nonpolar molecule here, each of the nonpolar molecules is going to be surrounded by water molecules. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay, so I've got fourteen, what are called ordered water molecules because they're trying to completely solubilize and surround that nonpolar uh, molecule. What happens if you think about adding oil? to water is that those nonpolars all clump together. And when they clump together, they have less ordered water molecules surrounding them. So let's count these up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine ordered water molecules. So when we go in this direction, where the nonpolar molecules come together, we have less ordered water molecules. And what that means is that there are more free water molecules and that the entropy of water has increased, which is a favorable event. So when we go from left to right, again, when we go in this aggregation event, that is a spontaneous event. And described thermodynamically, spontaneous events have a negative delta G. Oops, hold on. Okay, my brain's ahead of itself. Come back here. Delta S. All right, so spontaneous events have a negative delta G. We know that from moving forward, moving in this, what's looking like a forward direction, um, that the entropy of the water has increased. And how that helps delta G become more negative is because this T delta S is an entity that acts together. And T in biochemistry is always positive. We don't have negative body temperatures. So this entire term, when you have a negative times a positive, gives you a negative overall. And that helps contribute to a negative delta G because it's additive. Now, where does the delta H part come in? So we'll start with the delta H for water. When you free the water up, they're able to interact more favorably with each other because there's more free ones floating around. So between the water molecules, there's actually more favorable non-covalent interactions, which is a negative delta H. This means more favorable non-covalent interactions between the free waters. And again, this is additive. So we have negatives plus negatives gives us more negatives. So the driving force between how molecules interact with water has, has to do with the ability to free the water molecules, to get all the nonpolars to clump together. And that creates less surface area. So you have more free water molecules. There's also favorable non-covalent events going on between the water molecules. So if we look at going from, again, whoops, yeah, just that's okay. We'll go from left to right, but this time I'm going to describe the thermodynamics of the nonpolar molecule itself. 
So if you'll notice up here, this described the thermodynamics of water, which is a, a, a huge component. This piece right here um, is the driving force of why these nonpolars come together. But let's also describe the thermodynamics of the nonpolar. H of the nonpolar uh, minus T delta S of the nonpolar. Okay, so let's talk about the entropy of the nonpolar. So going from left to right, the entropy of the nonpolar, the chaos of it, is actually not favorable because it's, um, it's being constrained in its motion by clumping together. So this is um, a negative value. And again, when we have a negative times a negative, that gives you a positive, and I'm just going to put, that's not going to help get to a negative um, delta G on this side. However, there is um, a, a balance of the fact that when we put these nonpolar molecules together, we get lots and 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 lots of non-covalent interactions, which is a negative delta H. So this negative delta H is the non-covalent interactions between the nonpolar molecules themselves, and that is very, very, very favorable. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of interactions. And so sum total-wise, essentially, we have a very favorable... So really the system that we're looking at is the water plus the nonpolar molecules together. So I'm just going to kind of round up everything that was favorable. So this event right here, super, super favorable. Free the water, free the water, free the water, free the water. And this one is allow the waters to interact favorably with each other. So also very, 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 very favorable. So I'm just going to put... Smiley, smiley. The unfavorable thing that happened is the chaos or the orderedness of the nonpolars themselves. They were their movement is restricted, so that's not favorable. However, to sort of like tip the scale in the favorable direction, are all of the extra non-covalent interactions that happen when the two molecules get together. In this case, it's two. It could be 50. It could be a lot. Um, and so if you kind of look at the four pieces, there's a lot more um, tipping the scale in the, in the direction of spontaneous, which, I mean, we know just from observation that this the direction moving to where like the oil clumps together, we know that that just happens spontaneously without the addition of, of um, energy or input of energy. I mean, you have to shake the bottle to get them to separate out again. That's an input of energy. If you just let the bottle sit, they pop right back in together. So um, this would be the complete description of the hydrophobic effect using thermodynamics, where you're not only describing um, the thermodynamics of the water, which is hugely important, but you're also describing the thermodynamics of the molecule that's clumping together in the water. Okay, so let's apply this back to our lipids because we, what we're going to try to do now is explain why membranes form. Like how, why are there membranes? Why is there a cell membrane? Why is there a nuclear membrane? Why is there a mitochondrial membrane? And the reason for that is the fact that all of these um, membrane molecules are amphiphilic, amphipathic. I'm going to go to green here. They all have that polar head group and the nonpolar tail. And if you'll remember um, of these three here, this one right here is a membrane lipid. Okay. It has um, the nonpolar on the bottom and the polar head group on the top. It has a f it's a phospholipid. It's got a phosphate on it and it has two tails. So how do these amphiphilic, amphipathic 
um, membrane lipids associate in water. All right, so another uh, way of looking at the hydrophobic effect. So in water, if you put these amphipilic, amphipathic phospholipids in water, initially they would all be separate. Where's my highlighter? What do we want? Green? Sure. They'd all be separate. So they'd each be sort of encased in water separately. And then spontaneously, they will clump together. And what clumps together? Well, all the nonpolars go together on the inside. They hide from water together. And that creates less surface area. So you have more free water molecules. Free the water, free the water, free the water. And you get lots of non-covalent interactions in between these tails here. But you also get something else. So if I'm going, let's collect all of our information. So going in this direction, the delta S of the water is favorable. Free the water, free the water, free the water. The delta S of the phospholipid is not favorable because it's constrained in its movement. But the delta H of the waters with themselves are favorable because you have so many non-covalent interactions here. And then you also have the water molecules will make favorable non-covalent interactions with the phospholipid head groups. Super, super, super important. So not only are you getting um, the water molecules happily interacting with each other, but you still have, you, you get this added bonus of the water molecules favorably interacting with the phospho head groups. So I'm going to put double bonus here. The delta H of the phospholipid is also favorable. And that is because you've got tons and tons and tons of van der Waals. I'm going to just do VDW. You have tons of van der Waals there, and you are also getting these favorable non-covalent interactions here. So you have um, the water, the entropy of the water has pushed these all together, and then the delta H, the non-covalence, think of these like, like gum. The more that you have of them, the stickier that it gets. So it helps everything stick together. So you've got lots and lots of gum. Um, and so it sticks together. And the phospholipids tend to form a, a couple different kinds of structures. And I'm going to just kind of zoom in on this one. I would say the simplest of these is called the micelle. So if you look at the micelle, the micelle has all the inside of this, we'll do it in green, um, is just the tails. It's only tails, there's no water in there at all. And then you've got the phospho head groups circling all on the outside. Think of this as sort of like a tennis ball where the outside of the tennis ball are all the phospholipids and the inside of the tennis ball, the part that you can't get to is where all the fatty parts are. And the other kind, um, and so a micelle is essentially a monolayer. So if you look at this one up top, this is a monolayer where the phospho head groups are in the water and then all the fat is kind of sticking around outside. If you take a monolayer and make it into a sphere, you get a micelle. The most common that is actually in the cell is the bilayer. So the bilayer has, well, it has two layers. So if you look, here is the cutoff. So here's one layer. And then, oh, maybe I'll do green. I'll do black. And then here is the top layer. So the bilayer, again, has the feature of putting all the nonpolars on the inside, hide from water, hide from water, hide from water. And then it puts the polars on two edges, the outermost edge and the innermost edge. 
so that it still acts, it can act with water, but on the inside here, you can put all sorts of interesting polar molecules and trap them in. You can transport them places. Um, a, let's see, I'll call this, this one, because it's small, is called a vesicle. So a vesicle is a bilayer, is just a small bilayer. It can fit inside a cell. The other large bilayers are things like the cytoplasmic membrane, the nuclear membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is just a membrane, which is also a bilayer. Those are just like, take a vesicle and blow it way up. Um, and so the hydrophobic effect is what and the thermodynamics of it is what describes the formation of the bilayers, the cytoplasmic membranes. And without a cytoplasmic membrane, you have no cell. You can't live without a cytoplasmic membrane. It's not a thing. It's not possible. Okay, one little shout out because we're going to get there eventually is that I wanted to mention again that the hydrophobic effect is not exclusive to lipids. Hydrophobicity or how molecules interact with water it explains um, protein structure, DNA, RNA structure, carbohydrate structure, membrane structure, virus propagation, um, drug design and delivery. If you don't recognize this molecule that's uh, up at the top here, that's a DNA. And on the inside of the DNA are all the bases here. And those bases are the hydrophobic part. Um, of the nucleic acid, whereas the outside, maybe I should do this in blue, the outside, which is in two strands here, the outside here is the um, phosphodiester backbone, and that is the hydrophilic part. So DNA is amphoteric, and the bases clump in the middle because of the hydrophobic effect, and they repel water, whereas the phosphodiester backbone is hanging out with water because it makes lots of favorable non-covalent interactions. Um, you can see the same thing in this diagram of protein structure, where all of the ones that are in green are the hydrophilics. And then the ones that are in purple are hydrophobic. So again, proteins are also amphoteric. And when placed in water, all the hydrophobic clump together on the inside and all the hydrophilics are hanging out on the outside. So hydrophobicity and the hydrophobic effect describes basically all the structures of a cell and all the parts of a cell. Okay, this is our part four. Again, feel free, take a breath, take a break, light a candle, take some time for you, or get your notes out and let's keep going. So here are the learning objectives for part four. So part four is to explain membrane fluidity and the consequence of asymmetry uh, recognize sterile structure and nomenclature. Describe the function of sterols and how they impact fluidity. And assess the importance of cellular membranes. Here we go. So phospholipids, which are now drawn in this cartoon form, we're going to look at this, uh, these diagrams going left to right. Uh, they move. So the phospholipids, if you see this like blue one, they move in two different directions because they're mostly made of unsaturated fatty acids. They're, the membrane itself is very liquidy. It's very, very fluid. And so they can move um, in this direction and then this direction. So they have lateral diffusion within the membrane. And then the other ways that phospholipids can move is they can sort of flip across the membrane. And this is called transverse or flip-flop uh, diffusion. 
usually it actually takes like a protein catalyst called, you're going to love this, flipase. Yeah, it's an enzyme because it ends in ace. Flipase to take one of these and flip it across the membrane. Okay, so one, why am I talking about this? One, I just want to remind you, see all these little squiggly tails here means that these acyl tails, these fatty acids are um, mostly unsaturated cis fatty acids. So the membrane is nice and fluid, more like olive oil and less like butter. And that that means that the phospholipids can move back and forth um, actually pretty quickly. And they can also flip-flop. And the reason for the flip-flop is crazy important. So now we're going to look at this diagram that's on um, the right-hand side. So I'm going to talk you through like what this means. So you just notice that, again, there's circles and then there's tails. So these are all phospholipids. These are all membrane lipids. Um, the different tails have different meanings. So if it's a straight tail, that's saturated fatty acid. If it's a curved tail, it's mono unsaturated fatty acid, one double bond. And then if it's a squiggles, it's polyunsaturated fatty acid. So if you look at each of these three different membranes, it's a mixture. It, and so, yeah, just, just to diagram that it's a mixture. And then each of the head groups has sort of a different, um, oh, what do you call it? Just a different kind of coloring. Okay, so the purple is sphingomyelin. The red one is phosphatidylcholine. This one is phosphatidylethanolamine. Um, this is phosphatidylethanolamine with an extra phosphate. And then this one is phosphatidylserine. Okay, so what am I trying to describe here? What the importance of the flip-flop is to change the, the symmetry of the membrane. So if you look at this monolayer versus the one underneath, you'll notice that it's different from the top and the bottom. The top is mostly all um, purples and reds, whereas the bottom has a, has a whole bunch of other ones. And what can happen is in different events that are happening to the cell can cause these to flip up or flip down. Um, things that can cause them to flip up or flip down are, let's say that there is a drug that is trying to enter the cell there can be a signal where the phospholipids pop up and prevent the drug from entering. It can be a signal if you have enough of these popping up here or popping down to change the symmetry um, or to change the asymmetry, to change the message, that it can tell other cells like, hey, I'm infected with a virus or, hey, I'm a skin cell and you're a macrophage. Let's don't eat me. I don't, how do I, how else can I describe this? So the asymmetry means that the phospholipids have a second function and their second function is signaling. And the reason they're able to be signaling is because of the movement. Okay, one other way to try to describe this too. Okay, so remember that Morris code where it's like, beeps and dashes to just to make a message so let's say that this purple one was giving out a dot and this one was dot dot and then this so this will be dot 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 this will be dash dash dot and dash dash so if i were to read the message across the top it would be like beep 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 you get the idea if I were to read the message across the top of this one, it would be dash, 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 beep, 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 dash, dash. You get the idea. And so this membrane is sending a different message, literally, than this membrane. And the reason I'm looking at the top ones is usually the top. Um, this is the exo part. So this is the extracellular part, the part that is... Um, signaling to the outside of the cell. The inside is important, but the message that it sends outside is also really important for cell-to-cell -cell signaling, cell virus signaling, um, cell small molecule signaling. But the asymmetry 
um, is a way of the cell being able to send messages. So again, that means that the phospholipids have a second function in addition to being membrane support, which is that they're signaling molecules. Cool, huh? I think it's cool. All right. Our other kind of oddball membrane lipid is the sterol. You don't have to be able to draw these, but you should be able to recognize them. So let's talk about how they're named. They all have an alcohol group. All sterols have an alcohol group. They have to. So here's the alcohol group here. Here's the alcohol group here. The other thing that sterols have to have um, is the rest of this has to be just carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen. No oxygens. Okay. Okay, feature number one, must have an alcohol. Feature number two, must be carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen across the whole rest of the molecule. And then the other unique part is what's called the steroid... I know that's confusing because these are sterols, but this it's called a steroid nucleus. I really wish they would have called it the sterol nucleus because you use sterols to make steroids. But anyways, that's fine. Here's how it goes. A, B, C, D. This particular ring structure where it's one six-membered ring partnered right up with a second one. The third one sits on top. And then the fourth is a five-membered ring, and they're named going left to right, A, B, C, D. That is called a steroid nucleus. So all sterols have these three pieces. One, they have an alcohol, and the alcohol always comes off of ring, num uh, ring number A, ring letter A. The rest of the rings and all the decoration coming off the rings has to be carbon, 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 hydrogen. And then the ring structure itself has to be the specific cyclohexane, cyclohexane, cyclohexane to cyclopentane um, structure. Although aimed, it doesn't have to, they, there could be some double bonds in there, but it has to have that steroid nucleus to it. Again, be able to recognize sterols. There are various sterols, but they all have those three components. What the heck do they do? So I said that the sterols, not the steroids, but the sterols are membrane lipids. Because they're amphipathic, means that their polar head groups hang out outside. Polar OH head group. And their nonpolar tail goes into the bilayer because of the hydrophobic effect, right? And they serve different purposes at different temperatures. So at high temperatures, the sterols restrain the movement of the phospholipids. They basically um, keep the membrane together. They keep the membrane from just becoming so fluid and so liquidy that it disperses out. So they kind of add, they act as gum to keep the membrane stuck together. At lower temperatures, the sterols occupy the spaces between the phospholipids to prevent them, them from sticking to each other. So it enhances the fluidity. So I'll say, how do I say this? Um, yeah, keeps the membrane from becoming butter cell at low temperatures. Okay, that's the sterols. <gasps> okay, we made it. We did it. All right. Why do we need membranes? I think I mentioned this. I'm pretty sure I said this. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. You have to keep, you need membranes to separate the cells from their environment. And I'll go even further. To separate cells and, well, why am I doing a highlighter? And organelles from their environment. 
So if you haven't reviewed which of the organelles have a membrane, you probably will want to review them, but I'll highlight a couple of them here for you. Okay, so who has a membrane? Mitochondria has a membrane, uh, Golgi membrane, Nucleus has a membrane, uh, the plasma membrane is a membrane. So if we look at just those ones really quickly, what is common, what's the same about all of them? Like, what does this have in common with this, with this, uh, and then this? They're all containers, right? They're all like, they like think about like Tupperware container. They all hold stuff on the inside and they keep the stuff close together so it can interact with one another uh, more easily instead of floating through the cell trying to find uh, the next thing to do. Um, they keep it all contained. And without, without any of these, they would just be free floating pieces floating through water. Never be able, like the ability to replicate DNA never going to happen. You're never going to be able to get uh, on any reasonable time scale to get that RNA or DNA polymerase to the mind, to the DNA if it's just floating around in a huge, well, a huge ocean, essentially. So the membranes keep things together. Um, this is a, this is an electron micrograph of a real cell um, showing all the biological membranes and all the biological membranes are in black. And so you can see the nuclear membrane is here. Um, it might be kind of hard to see. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit, you can see the endoplasmic reticulum. Look, it's all these wavy lines here. Um, the mitochondria has um, two membranes, two, two bilayers. So it has, it gets quite dark. And then all of these black circles are storage granules. So think vesicles, um, think micelles, and that's why they're so black is because they're holding stuff on the inside, but they're mostly made of lipids. Oh, I found another mitochondria right here. Anyways, I thought that was neat. Anyways, without membranes, there would be no cells, no organelles. There would be the... Um, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't exist. It's not a thing. Okay, we did it. We made it to the end. Thanks for playing, watching Biochem, and I'll see you in class.